Welcome to Control Your Career, a podcast to help you conquer uncertainty, shatter imposter syndrome, and rise above the expectations imposed by others. My name is Julia Toothaker, and I am the career coach and strategist at Ride the Tide Collective, my career development company where I offer career coaching courses, and I have a plethora of free content. I have been doing this work for over a decade, and I want to help empower professionals like you to find clarity, navigate your current career with finesse, and propel yourself toward career advancement in alignment with your unique personality, preferences, and values. This podcast is a great place to start your journey toward controlling your career. Season 10 is all about managers and specifically what managers want and expect from their employees and teams. I've brought on people managers with at least 10 years of experience managing who are also currently managers to help you understand their mindset and expectations. Each episode will have action items that you can apply to your unique situation and consider in your relationship with your manager. You can find this episode and more at ridethetidecollective.com. And you can connect with me on LinkedIn, where I post career information and inspiration to help you control your career. Welcome, everyone. I am very excited for another episode of The Manager's Perspective. And with me for this episode is Renee Trotman. And I am so excited to have her as a guest because her background is so extensive, not only in people management, but also in HR. So I think this is going to be a really lively conversation. And Renee, I'm just going to throw it right to you. I would love for you to do a little introduction of yourself, who you are, what you've done, and some of your experience within people management. Sure. Wonderful. Thank you, Julia, for having me. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you today. Again, my name is Renee Trotman. I have been in the people management space in HR for about 20 years. Um, My scope has been very progressive in leadership scope and abilities and what I've covered. Um, I started my career in the banking industry, um, and then I moved into the education space and healthcare I've worked for a variety of different industries and a variety of different organizational sizes, nonprofit, education, Fortune 500. Um, I went to school for uh, management. I got my bachelor's uh, in management with a focus in HR. Um, And then I moved into a master's of jurisprudence in labor and employment law. Um, I became an executive coach and I'm working on my doctorate degree in management and organizational leadership. Um, So I started out very young in management in my early 20s, um, working and learning the ropes of management. So it's been a progressive journey. Okay. I I hope everybody heard everything (laughs) that she's done because it's such an amazing path that you've had and the level of education that you've had. I'm so impressed with you and I'm so happy that you're here today. We're going to talk about so much. So we're going to jump right in. And I, I want to hear, you know, you you just mentioned you've been in management since your early 20s. So I would imagine you have learned so much in that time. And I would love to know, what is your people management style now? And then how have you seen it evolve over the years, some of those learnings that you've had throughout the years? Sure. Yes. I I I definitely have learned so much. It's been a journey. Um, I'm so grateful for the experience because I think now I'm at a place where relationship building is important in my management style, Um, being very collaborative um, Mm -hmm. and being very team oriented. Um, And I think that really has set the tone and been a culmination of my journey from the earlier years. Um, I think I started off really strong with relationship building early on. Um, And then I had to balance that. After you build relationships, people get comfortable. How do you create boundaries? How do you develop accountability and have the appropriate balance to make sure that the objectives, the goals, not only for the individual, but for the team, for the organization are being met? 
So I really have an open door policy. I ensure that we are, uh, expectations are properly set now. Um, and I really balance that relationship building because when we come to work, I think as people managers, we have to remember that they're people. They're human. They're not mm -hmm. just the job. And being able to have that focus on people and who they are, to a, to an extent, you're able to maximize how you develop, how you grow, and how you're able to hold them accountable. That's at the core, I believe, of how you really drive engagement and performance. Okay, I have to say for the audience, for people who are listening to this, this is growth. As a people manager, this is the type of growth that you want. Exactly what Renee is talking about from her career. Because we hear so many horror stories about people managers who don't treat their people well and they don't understand that human side. And not that you were ever like that, but I think where you're at now is where people need to strive to be if they're in that people management space, right? <laughs> like They want to get to that place. Absolutely. And you know, Julia, I say being on the HR side and being an HR leader and then coming from working outside of the HR space as a leader, I think I have a different balance. I always like to say my expertise in HR when I work with people managers is very distinguished. I'm speaking as a people manager from an HR perspective, but also from not working in HR. And I think it's so important when you have those conversations with people managers that you're able to understand where they're coming from. You're able to understand their uniqueness, their strengths to be able to work with them to grow. And I think that when I, you're absolutely right. You see lots of horror stories. I hear them on the HR side. And I think, Julia, honestly, we, as in the past 10 years, I think organizations have done an excellent job at doing internal mobility and growth. Mm -hmm. But I think where there's been a gap is being able to set people up for success as people managers. You can be great individual contributors. However, if you haven't set people up to now lead, that's where you see some of the horror stories. Yes. Oh, man. I could, we could have a whole podcast episode just on that topic. <laughs> but for, for the sake of, of this episode, I want to get a little bit more into your relationship with your people and your team and some things that you've learned over the years. And I want to start with the hiring side mm -hmm. of all of this, right? So I would love to know, and this is very, uh, this is very tactile because I feel like so many people are talking about, I don't know what the managers want. I don't know what the recruiters want. Like that's a common thing that I hear from my clients and just out in the world. So I would love to know from you when you are hiring somebody, what are you looking for specifically on a resume and then also in the interview process? Excellent question, Julia. I think um, first and foremost, I think your resume and your CV is paramount, right? It's your first impression, your first professional um, impression on an organization. So I'm looking for how do they professionally present? Are they outlining their experience, their education, their skills? Are you able to do something unique that stands out outside of just talking about the actual duties that you did? What were some of your accomplishments in that role? What was the size organization? What was the industry that really starts to distinguish? And I think when I begin to see those things, it helps me begin to develop, okay, what kinds of questions do I want to ask to get to know this person better? Um, so I think starting at those key points really allow me the opportunity to say, um, you know, they have a good background. So for example, if they may not have direct correlated experience, listing out your skills, your abilities, your experiences, the format of your resume is so important if you don't have some of the direct. We want to be able to see what are your transferable skills. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, I have, I have to jump in on this one because I always want to highlight when somebody talks about accomplishments on mm -hmm. the resume, because so often when I see resumes, and I'm sure you see it as well, it really does sound like a list of duties, right? Like they take their job description and they put it into, <laughs> into the resume and it doesn't say anything about the impact that you've had. 
and how you did your job, right? It's not just, you know, maybe you did something similar to somebody that also has the same title, but you're still you and you're still unique and you have your own approach and your own results that are going to be different from that person. So I so appreciate you talking about the accomplishments because I think that's one of the number one things that I see missing from the resume. Do you feel that it's similar for you? I agree. You know, and I think here's the thing too, Julia, we, you know, depending upon the organization, they may not be using applicant tracking systems, or if they do, they're using Indeed. And the Indeed resumes don't always come through formatted well. So, uh, you know, one of the things that I tell people is if you're using Indeed, make it look structured. Because if that Indeed resume comes over when you apply versus your formatted one, it may not create the right impression. So I absolutely agree. Accomplishments really begin to set individuals apart. It's able to really distinguish, again, not only that you're qualified, but how are you going to show up and fulfill the roles and responsibilities? What impact are you going to make? One of the Mm -hmm. things that I distinguish when I see is people that not only talk about the accomplishments, but what was the length of time? So people, I've seen resumes where they talk about, I made an impact in three months or six months. Those are really important because when you're looking at the job description, some job descriptions we know are very short in detail and some very long. So it's also being able to look at that and make sure that your resume has the key things, but also speak to some of those components of the job to to stand out. Yes, I love that. Okay, I can already tell you that's going to be a clip that I promote because that that is such good advice. And I really hope that the people who are listening to this heed that because that's something that I hear from everyone it's not it's not a unique thing and for whatever reason we're not seeing that shift in the resume so i really hope that people hear this and apply it to their own resume i'd also love to know the interview side that's something mm-hmm. i think especially when people get down to like that last interview or they're one of the final candidates what are you really looking for in the interview process from somebody Great question. I think when you get to the finalist round, especially, that means that you're probably there with either one other person or two other individuals, potentially, in my experience. And I think when you're in that slot, that means that you've met the bar in terms of the initial discussions, um, the knowledge, skills, and abilities you've presented well. Um, But I think that also when we talk about the resume and the presentation and accomplishments, I think also what's important to organizations is one cultural fit for your best fit candidate and also the the fit within the team and who's people managing that team. Mm -hmm. And so I think you want to be able to hone in in those final interviews on the questions. They're typically a little bit more drilled into culture. Mm -hmm. Um, so what's the kind of core values of the organization, um, how you fit in. So being able to really hone in, speak to that. I also think coming with core questions that are not the generic ones. And I know you probably see this all the time when you support people, um, in their career development and guidance, it's being able to say, okay, as you develop, take notes, what did you hear in the conversation? What did you hear about the leader? What did you hear about the team? What did you hear about the objectives in drilling? Why? Because you also want to make sure it's a fit for yourself as well. So I think in that final interview, it's being able to show that you've listened effectively through the interview and you're asking detailed questions that's really going to distinguish and demonstrate that you are going to be the best fit candidate. Yes. Okay. I love that because again, this is something that when I work with clients, And I hear a lot of people come to me, I've been the finalist so many times and I'm not getting the position. And I'm like, either it was likely a culture fit or there Mm -hmm. was something that you weren't saying that somebody else was Mm -hmm. saying. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. I have found, Julia, that the when we select the individual being on the HR side and being on the people manager side, I tend to look for... When I look at the questions, I also ask the question for me personally, why are you the best fit candidate? Why should you be selected? And it's an opportunity when those types of questions open up, brag on yourself, I like to say. Mm -hmm. You know, don't hold back because it could be one thing in there 
that really sets you apart. And when it comes down to culture, being able to really demonstrate and hone in specifically your responses to how you fit in, I think really is a game changer. Yes, I love that. And as you were saying that, I was even thinking about, depending on the role and the level that you're applying for, your ability to answer a question like that will also show how are you going to show up for yourself and your team in terms of being an advocate or being able to influence across the organization. Because if you don't trust yourself and you don't have that positive language about yourself, are you going to be able to support your team and the organization effectively? And I understand nerves, you know, people get nervous and all of that. It's not that like we, we can screen for that. But it's about are you are you even articulating anything that sets your case up well? Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. Hey there, Julia here. Is this episode resonating with you? Maybe it's got you questioning how you can better communicate with your manager, team, or just learn more about how to control your career. Well, I've busted into this episode to tell you about my career action coaching. Career coaching is more than job search and resumes. It's also about managing the day-to-day situations that come up in your career. This coaching option is perfect for the career management situations that you're dealing with, along with other career-related challenges or goals. This is a flexible coaching option to help tackle specific topics to move forward efficiently and confidently. Not all coaching requires a six-month commitment. Career Action Coaching is three hour-long sessions that can be customized to your unique needs. Before committing, let's discuss what you need in my complimentary Career Coaching Clarity Call. The link will be in the show notes and the description for this episode. Now let's get back to the show. So let's go past the, the hiring process and into working with employees. I would love to know what do one-on-ones look like for you? How do you conduct them? Because I feel like everybody has a slightly different approach and I would love to know what that looks like for you. Sure. I think my one-on-ones look a little bit different based on a couple of things. One, in the beginning, when someone starts, your one-on-ones are going to be structured a little bit differently um, where that relationship building takes place setting of expectations, and really challenging that individual to really create impact. Um, But overall, in general, my formats of one-on-one, I first start off with the personal. How are you today? How are you showing up? Is everything okay? Um, I think that tends to Uh, bring the wall down a bit when people may be feeling nervous because people, even if they're comfortable, sometimes they're nervous in one-on-one. So creating that, what I like to call psychologically safe space Um, And then structuring it around, you know, I have an agenda, but what's most important in how we spend our time together today so that I can support you. I also try to use a servant leadership approach, meaning how can I serve and support as your leader on the things that we're working on, your goals, your objectives, to make sure that you're set up for success. Um, I find doing that. I find being able to wrap up at the end with uh, recapping what we went through keeping a running document of our notes um, so that people have two forms of the communication, the verbal form and also a written form. So you're aligning to um, someone's preferred style of communication or allowing them to be able to have both formats. Um, And then being able to check in at the end, what are the additional things that you need, tools, resources, or support from me. Um, And I think that method and structure has been successful for me and my team to be able to feel safe, to be able to ask questions in a safe space and really be able to build that working relationship. That is such a great structure. I I love just the mix of everything and really giving uh, the employee an opportunity to come to the table along with you as a manager already having things that you want to talk about. There are so many people that they're like, my manager never has anything in our one-on-ones to talk mm-hmm. about, and I don't know what to do. So this leads me to a side question, because I think this hits a little bit on your HR experience. 
<laughs> it's more so. How would you advise someone, a, an employee who maybe does not work directly for you in another part of the organization who is dealing with a manager that is not as attentive, who maybe doesn't prioritize the one-on-ones or doesn't have any structure to it? What what would be your recommendation for them? I would say, Julia, I think being able to really take an opportunity to be proactive, right? If you know what your roles and your responsibilities are, um, that you are being able to ask for what you need. I always say be a champion for yourself. Um, So although your manager may not be one that is able to sometimes open the door, I think that you create space and you act for that space um, and you come prepared. So don't just um, come waiting for them to, but come in a format that allows you the ability to be able to say, here are some things that I need, here are some questions that I need. And then it allows you the opportunity to really be able to um, drive impact for yourself, right? And really Mm -hmm. be an advocate. Oh, I love that. Such such great advice. And here's the reality too. I think some people are just difficult to work with. <laughs> yes, you know, yes. some managers are difficult and they might not respond to that well. But I think as long as you are approaching yes. it and you feel good about it and you have a record of those interactions, that's as much as you can do mm-hmm. at that point until they decide to engage with you. <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think also too, Julia, I think being able to um, take the opportunity to seek out HR as well, you know, so if you potentially need some support, um, seeking out HR for guidance because every culture is a little bit different, right? Mm-hmm. So if there is a culture where you need support and you're not comfortable, what's your chain of command, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think following that is really supportive as well. Some people don't have the courage in the moment, Julia, to also say send an email, right? But the number one thing that I always tell individuals is You have to advocate for yourself and help your leader help you. Sometimes leaders don't know, meaning that they don't have it. You need to give them the opportunity to adjust, learn, grow, to support you. Yes, I love that. I love that advice. And I want to bring something up because I think there's a very strong narrative around HR right now that HR is not your friend. They're out to get you, all all of that negativity. And this is an example of when HR will support you without doing anything else. So most HR, this this is my has been my experience as well. You could uh, you can let me know if I'm wrong, but basically you can go to HR with these questions. Hey, how do I handle this situation? I'm not quite sure what to do. I've tried this. I've tried that. Do you have any other strategies for me? Most of the HR Mm -hmm. people that I know and that I've worked with, they're very open to that. And they're not going to run to your manager and say Mm -hmm. something. That's generally a confidential conversation because they see that you're trying to figure it out on your own. They don't go generally to the manager until there's some kind of complaint that's formally filed. And then that's a whole other situation. (laughs) Am I right on that? Absolutely. 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 And I think that you have to, and it's true, some some, some HR is just like some leaders are better than others. Um, but I think the, the way that you advocate is you, you have to make an attempt, right? And that's showing that you've made attempt for yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think being, when you go to HR only for the problems, I think that you don't allow the organization, you don't allow a leader the opportunity to potentially support you in a better way. So I think that it's being open. You have to give it a try. Um, I say, you know, quote unquote, innocent until proven guilty in the sense that unless you try it, you don't always know. Um, and I think that's really important. Yes. All right. Let's let's go into something a little bit more negative, but I hope that we can help resource people here as well. Let's talk about PIPs or performance improvement plans. Some people have different names for them, but I would love to know, and this might be kind of twofold for you because you are a people manager, but you also have the HR lens. What, what is an employee doing to even get to that point and can they recover from it? Because most people think that once you're on a PIP, 
you're out. The company's trying to get rid of you. Can you provide some context from your experience yeah. there? Absolutely. I think a performance improvement plan, a PIP, is you can recover. Let's start there. Um, I think people have to take it very seriously. I think that people have to also make sure that you don't just assume negatively. Um, one of my mantras is always have assumption of good intent. This leader really may be looking to, um, as a as a as an additional step, really be more clear in a written format. What are your areas of opportunity and how do they support you and what are the specific areas within those let's say competencies of work that you really need to improve upon i think that um one thing is if there's not already established in your kind of um, performance improvement plan what the manager support is you ask for weekly meetings and touch points mm -hmm. unless it's part of your regular one-on-one -on -one. Um, ask for what you need. Um, I think it's also important to take a moment after a PIP to review everything and come back with questions um, for clarity um, mm -hmm. and really make sure that you are working on those very specific areas. I think oftentimes what I've seen in my experience is people, um, one, throw up their hand and say, well, I'm out the door already. And so they give up. Or they say, you know what? I'm just going to work really, really, really hard and just, you know, get things done. And they don't get into the details. Mm -hmm. I always say, Julia, there's two parts of performance. There's the what, meaning your tangible goals, the specific things you need to accomplish. And then there's the how. How do you show up every day? Also, I think through the PIP, we're trying to determine, is it a will issue or a skill issue? Um, and so I think being able to be very um, intentional and really driving what you need to do in that pit is going to be so important to recover. Okay. I, I love this. The will and the skill that is, I, I love that because <laughs> I think that people, this, oh, I have so many thoughts running through my head right now <laughs> because I think when it's a skill issue, a lot of times, if you are an employee coming into a scenario, you have to be honest about your skill set. And oh, unfortunately, absolutely. I'm hearing a lot of people who are choosing to lie on their resumes and their applications and all of that about their skill level. And I think that this is a scenario where that could really backfire on you, especially if it's a very technical position. But even if it's not, I mean, it, it mm -hmm. could just backfire on you. And mm -hmm. I feel like the skill part of it, unless it is something that is truly outside of your wheelhouse or your comfort level, that can be, I think, pretty easily fixed and managed with training and education and all of that, unless you lied. But the will issue, your attitude, how you're showing up, how you're treating others, if that's the reason for the PIP, like you as an employee have to really take a step back and go, am I showing up well, right? Because obviously I'm being perceived a certain way and you have to do that internal reflection, which I think is hard for people to hear. Mm -hmm. It is. It is very hard for people to hear. And I think that that's where being able to be uh, introspective in self-reflection to really do a self-check, as I like to call it, um, that is really going to be important in this process because there is something that's been identified. And I always tell people when they come to my office as HR, when they say, well, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, I said, but what you have to also remember is this is an organization. We have an expectation of how we want you to work. And you have to make sure that you're not always just completing the task. Or if you're not, again, how are you showing up? And I think that is hard for people. And either, Julia, they're going to um, be able to have that self-reflection and improve or they're not. All right, let's move the conversation to something a little bit more positive than talking about PIPs. But even though I, that's such a good conversation to have because I think that people need to understand, again, that manager's perspective, right? But let's talk about 
growth. So how do you as a manager keep your employees growing in their position? And what is your role versus their role? So I think with professional development, I think it's a partnership. Um, I think when we have our one-on-one discussions, one of the key pieces as a leader and a people manager is being able to really identify what are the areas of growth? Uh, Where do people want to grow? And oftentimes, Julia, I have people that say, I just want to stay in my role. Um, And I think it's being able to support individuals and how do they still grow within their role Um, and versus those that want to grow into people management or into senior level roles or other departments. Um, So I think that's the part as a people manager I own. I'm able to say, you know, from those meetings, take note. What are those things? So when things are happening in the organization or externally, I'm able to identify those and bring those back in support. I think from the employee's perspective, they own being ready to talk about that. So when there's created spaces, being prepared to say, this is what's important to me. These are some of my growth plans and being able to support in that manner. Okay, I love that you gave a nod to the people that really (laughs) don't want that career growth because I've had a number of friends who were like that or even people who go through seasons where they're like, I can't be ambitious right now. Like, I just need to be because there's something else going Mm -hmm. on. And I I love that you said that because I think employees need to hear that. And also if there are other people managers listening Not everyone on your team wants to be the rock star, right? Mm -hmm. Some people Mm -hmm. just want to show up. They want to do their job, do it well, get their paycheck and go home. So true. So true. And it's being able to support that, right? And I think as people managers, you have to know your people um, and you have to leverage, right? So to your point, maybe that individual is really good at their job and you leverage them as an internal lead, right? I think everyone's a leader within a team in their own right, in their own way. And so as a people manager, helping to develop that and say, you know what, maybe as we onboard new people, you're going to be an onboarding champion or a peer mentor. Or if you don't want to do that. Maybe you help me behind the scenes um, and how we develop in growing our teams and team meetings and um, different initiatives. So I think it's being able to work jointly. It's a joint effort and a joint partnership. I don't think any employee should just expect the organization or their people manager to just do it on their own. They have to come to the table prepared. Yes, yes. I feel like that's such a theme here, right? Like, yes, your people manager needs to pay attention to you, but you as an employee, you have to have some idea of where you're going or what you want, where you're at in this season, whatever that looks like. And you have to articulate that. If you just sit back, nobody's going to know. It's it's a relationship. <laughs> it is. Like any relationship, two-way street, two-way communication, right? So I think, um, but I think also, Julia, organizations and leaders have to create space. They have to create psychological safety. They have to build the relationships in order to, again, develop the two-way communication that's necessary to support employees in this area. Yes. Oh, I love that. I love that. Okay. I want to close out on a positive note and help resource anybody Mm -hmm. who's listening to this. So I would love to know if you could give current employees any advice to be successful in their position and with their manager, what would that be? I think the biggest thing, Julia, that I would say is you own your individual performance, right? I think being able to Figure out ways in which that you're able to effectively communicate with your people managers, your leadership teams, being able to own your job, uh, being agile, adaptable, flexible to the uh, ever-changing environments of the work workforce. I think over the years, as things have shifted, I tend to see people 
really want the organization to just lean towards their needs. And I think it's a balance, like we said earlier mm-hmm. about relationships. It's two-way, but also the employer has a little bit more of an advantage. We are here paying you to do a job. Um, and I think where um, the space is created, it's being able to champion for yourself. It's being able to advocate for yourself. And it's being able to learn your job and know what tools and resources you need for you to be successful. And I always say, um, cry out for help, right? If there's a need for help, know your resources. If it's not your people manager, know your chain of command. Is it the next manager up? If they're, if you're not comfortable with them, is it the HR department that you have? Um, it's just knowing your resources so that you can be the best employee you can be for that organization and feel good about the contributions that you're making to the organization as a whole. Oh, that was such a perfect way to end. (laughs) That was amazing. Renee, thank you so much. I want to give you a chance to talk about your consulting as well. I'm going to put your LinkedIn information in the blog post for this episode, but let us know what are you doing on the consulting side for HR and how can people get in contact with you? Absolutely. So I, my consultancy is called the HR Boutique, um, and we work with small to mid-sized organizations. We're the hrboutique.info. Um, and really, my work is helping be a true advisor and counsel to leaders uh, in how people management and employment law really intersect and work hand in hand, right? We can do all these things to people manage, but we also need to make sure that we're doing it compliantly. And so my work as a consultant Consultant is taking my many years of experience in working with people managers at all levels um, and really ensuring that they are the best leaders that they can be compliantly uh, and ensuring that they're able to move the organization forward and make sure that their people operations department and HR departments are working at their maximum capacity um, to really drive and support the business as a strong business partner. Oh, I love that. Renee, thank you so much. I can guarantee I'm going to be having you back because we're going to have some other conversations around some of your other specialty areas. So audience, I hope you enjoyed her because Mm -hmm. she's been amazing. Thank you so much. And I'm so glad that we were able to get you on the podcast. Thank you, Julia, for having me. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Mm -hmm.